Let's talk about gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as GERD. Now, when it comes to GERD, we should first review some of the basics in terms of the anatomy of the normal esophagus. So let's picture here that we have a typical patient. We have here our esophagus, and this is ultimately going to go into the gastroesophageal uh, junction or GE junction, and ultimately into the stomach. The stomach will ultimately transition into the small intestine, the bowel, the rectum, and the anus. However, when it comes to the esophagus itself, we should note that the first one-third of the esophagus is going to be composed of skeletal muscle. This is in contrast to the lower one-third of the esophagus, which is going to be composed of smooth muscle. And this is going to be important as we move forward in our lecture series in that certain conditions are characteristically going to affect certain parts of the esophagus. However, when it comes to GERD, the real key that we need to keep in mind is that within our stomach, we have the presence of these parietal cells. And these parietal cells are ultimately going to produce acid, often in the form of hydrochloric acid. And that acid ultimately has the potential to reflux into the lower esophagus. Generally speaking, however, in our typical patient, we're going to have the presence of this lower esophageal sphincter, also abbreviated here as the LES. And the LES, if it has sufficient tone, is essentially going to keep this acid from refluxing into the lower esophagus. However, in our patients with GERD, classically, they will have a transient relaxation of this lower esophageal sphincter that allows this passageway here to open up allowing the reflux of acid into the lower esophagus. And over time, this can lead to the development of strictures. It can lead to the development of Barrett esophagus, as well as adenocarcinoma of the lower esophagus. Showing this a slightly different way, we have a schematic on the left-hand side of the presentation where you can see a healthy, normal patient in which we have this production of gastric acid by the parietal cells of the stomach However, you see that this acid stops approximately here in the stomach and is not refluxing into the lower esophagus. This is in contrast to our patients with GERD in which we are going to see some of this acid coming up into the lower esophageal sphincter, which over time can lead to various symptoms, which we will discuss in detail throughout this lecture, as well as complications, including Barrett esophagus and our fear complication of adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. Now, it is also important to recognize that we have some key diagnostic modalities that we can utilize in our workup of patients with symptoms of esophageal pathology. We have, of course, esophageal manometry, which allows us to assess the pressures at various points during the swallowing cycle throughout the esophagus. However, for our purposes in terms of gastroesophageal reflux disease, this is not going to be a particularly useful modality we will see more of this in our patients with, for example, achalasia, and we discuss this in a separate lecture. However, one modality that you will see used commonly in our patients with suspected gastroesophageal reflux disease is the use of 24-hour pH monitoring. This is where we can essentially stick a catheter through the patient's nose, down their nasopharynx, and ultimately into their esophagus and we generally drop this just proximal to the gastroesophageal junction. This catheter has a built-in pH sensor, which allows us to analyze the pH throughout the patient's esophagus. And if we notice that the pH is decreased at this portion here, where the lower esophageal sphincter is ultimately supposed to prevent the reflux of acid, then this can help us to make a diagnosis over a 24-hour period of gastroesophageal reflux disease. Another modality that you may see used in our patients with GERD who have red flag signs and symptoms is the use of an endoscopy, also known as an esophagogastroduodenoscopy, also known as an EGD. This essentially involves two components when we insert this probe down the patient's esophagus and drop it into their stomach up to the first portion of the duodenum. First of all, because this has a camera that is built into the probe, this is going to allow us to look at the gross appearance of the lower esophagus, as well as the stomach and the first portion of the duodenum.
In addition, this also is going to have a tool present which will allow us to take biopsies, if indicated, of the esophagus, the stomach, or the first portion of the duodenum. And so this is especially useful in patients where we may have suspicion for the presence of, for example, esophageal adenocarcinoma. So again, when we are evaluating a patient with suspected esophageal pathology in general, we can utilize manometry to look at pressures at different points along the esophagus. We can use 24-hour pH monitoring, for example, in our patients with suspected GERD, or we can utilize the endoscopy, which we just discussed in detail here. So now that we have discussed these three modalities in detail, let's delve into the specifics of how our patients with gastroesophageal reflux disease are going to present. Now classically, these patients are going to present with quote unquote heartburn, which is going to occur 30 minutes to one and a half hours after having a meal. This typically is going to improve with the use of over-the-counter antacids or with the use of proton pump inhibitors or PPIs, which are going to work by reducing that acid production within the stomach. Additionally, these patients will classically have worsening of their symptoms when they are lying down. And this should make sense to us because if we once again draw out our normal esophagus here, which ultimately empties into the patient's stomach, and we then have that patient having a reflux of acid from the stomach into the lower portion of the esophagus, we can imagine that if this patient were lying down and we were to flip this by 90 degrees, that we would instead have something that looks like this. So the acid level would be even more easily reaching this lower portion of the esophagus. And as that acid refluxes during the night, this patient is going to have a worsening of their reflux symptoms. Additionally, patients with GERD may classically present with what is known as a globus sensation or having a lump in the throat. Additionally, because patients with GERD can present with anginal symptoms, these patients may be confused with those who have coronary artery disease as they can present with chest pain. Additionally, GERD can also manifest as chronic cough, and this is very high yield to keep in mind as well. As a matter of fact, GERD is one of the top three causes of chronic cough that we will see in our patients, which comes after post-nasal drip being the most common cause, followed by asthma causing chronic cough, and finally by GERD. And so this is extremely important to keep in mind, both for examinations and clinically, when we suspect that a patient with a chronic cough may indeed simply have GERD. Now, when it comes to the pathophysiology of GERD, and we have already spoken about this a bit in our introduction, this is going to involve reflux from the stomach into the lower portion of the esophagus. And by far, the number one cause of this is going to be transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation, which once that relaxes, this is going to allow the reflux of this acid from the stomach into the lower portion of the esophagus. Additionally, these patients may also be predisposed to the development of GERD as a result of an incompetent lower esophageal sphincter. Additionally, these patients may have gastroparesis. This is something that we commonly see in the diabetic population. Additionally, those who smoke cigarettes have an increased risk of developing gastroesophageal reflux disease. And of course, also our patients with hiatal hernias. Now, when it comes to these patients' diets as well and their lifestyles, this can be extremely important in whether or not they're going to experience the symptoms of GERD. As we can see here, there are several key foods that worsen GERD and may show up in your patient vignettes on examinations. These include the consumption of chocolate, fatty foods, coffee, and alcohol, all of which work by increasing the production of acid in the stomach, which is going to increase the likelihood that these patients will develop the signs and symptoms of GERD. Now, the real question is, why do we care about all this? Of course, our patients are having symptoms. We want to be able to help our patients and make them feel better in terms of those symptoms. However, what we really, really care about in terms of treating this condition is that we want to prevent the progression from GERD symptoms to chronic inflammation of the lower esophagus and ultimately the development of various complications which can be extremely serious resulting from this condition. These complications include esophageal strictures, erosive esophagitis, aspiration pneumonia, 
Upper GI bleeds, this is especially true in our patients with peptic ulcer disease, Barrett esophagus, and ultimately our most feared complication of GERD, which is esophageal adenocarcinoma. Now that we've discussed the pathophysiology as well as the potential complications of GERD, let's delve into the diagnosis, workup, and management of this condition. The real key when we have a patient with suspected GERD is that we are going to start treating these patients empirically in most cases with the use of a proton pump inhibitor or a PPI. And therefore, this is going to be the first step in management in the majority of our patients with suspected GERD. Additionally, in these patients, if they go on to be refractory to PPIs, we can perform 24-hour pH monitoring in these patients, which is considered to be the best test when it comes to actually evaluating whether this patient indeed has gastroesophageal reflux disease. Beyond this, however, we can go on to obtain an endoscopy in a few key situations. The first being if the patient is refractory to empiric PPI therapy. The second situation is if the patient has long-standing symptoms greater than five years. And the reason that we perform an endoscopy in this scenario is because we ultimately want to rule out the possibility of dysplasia as well as cancer which are our feared complications of this condition. And that's why we write here to rule out Barrett esophagus as well as adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. Beyond this, we should also be sure to get an endoscopy when we have a patient who is exhibiting alarm symptoms. And so therefore this calls into question what are considered to be alarm symptoms in a patient with gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, I'm certainly glad that you asked this question as we've dedicated this entire slide to describing what the alarm symptoms are in a patient with gastroesophageal reflux disease related symptoms. These include a patient having new onset of symptoms at greater than 60 years of age, having dysphagia or dinophagia. Important to point out here that dysphagia refers to difficulty swallowing whereas odynophagia refers to, oh, I'm having pain while I'm swallowing, weight loss, persistent or recurrent vomiting, as well as GI bleed. This can include hematemesis, melana, or anemia. And if we see any of these alarm symptoms in our patient with reflux symptoms, then ultimately these should be a tip off that these are red flags and that we should absolutely get an endoscopy in these patients absolutely essential to keep this in mind, especially as we move into our next slide, which is ultimately going to give us the ultimate algorithm for the management of our patients with GERD. Now the real key here is that when we have a patient with the signs and symptoms of reflux, we should ask two key questions. The first of these questions is, is this a male patient greater than 50 years old with duration of symptoms greater than five years or other cancer risk factors, such as smoking. And the second question we should ask is, does this patient exhibit any of the alarm symptoms or red flag symptoms that we discussed on the previous slide? If the answer to both of these questions is no, then we are going to treat these patients empirically with proton pump inhibitor trials. The initial trial is going to be giving these patients a PPI one time per day for a period of eight weeks. If that patient's symptoms persist, then we are going to increase this PPI to two times a day or switch to a different proton pump inhibitor. For example, from omeprazole, say, to pantoprazole. If the patient's symptoms improved after either of these trials, then we simply continue the PPI as we know that this is working and addressing the patient's underlying symptoms. In other words, this patient just has GERD. However, if the patient's symptoms persist, even after these two trials of proton pump inhibitors, then we should proceed to 24-hour pH monitoring to evaluate, does this patient really have GERD? And after that, we can consider the use of an endoscopy in order to rule out dysplasia, cancer, or another etiology of the patient's symptoms. Moving beyond this, if we were to answer yes to either of these two key questions, then in this case, we are going to go directly to an endoscopy with biopsies.
If on this endoscopy, we see no evidence of esophagitis, then we can perform manometry, which allows us to look at pressures at different points along the esophagus, or we can consider 24-hour pH monitoring once again in order to determine does this patient really have GERD, as this is our best test in order to evaluate that. If, however, on our endoscopy with biopsies, we find that the patient does have esophagitis or inflammation of the esophagus, then we should manage this patient based on the specific etiology of the esophagitis that this patient has. More on this in our separate module on esophageal disorders in which we talk about, for example, eosinophilic esophagitis or infectious esophagitis etiologies such as in our patients with candidiasis, CMV, or HSV esophagitis. However, more on that in our esophageal disorders lecture, but for our purposes here, this really sums up all that we need to know in terms of the workup and management of our patients with reflux symptoms. We are essentially asking these two key questions to determine, is there a good chance that this patient has underlying cancer or something really, really serious? If not, we can go ahead and try empiric PPI therapy. If yes to either of these questions, however, then it is our duty to get an endoscopy with biopsies in order to rule out dysplasia as well as cancer. If you like this video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, as well as share with your classmates. And we have tons of other great content elsewhere on our channel, as well as at BoardsMD.com. This is BoardsMD, and this is GERD.